Hi, and welcome to our last lecture of the semester. Can you believe this? This lecture, I'm going to go over the ear, and we're going to cover the ear, the anatomy of the ear. We'll talk about hearing, and we'll talk a little bit about balance. So obviously our ear is just a giant funnel. For hearing, it's sound waves. They're physical waves that bounce all around the, uh, around the air. They use air basically to be transmitted. And if we look at the ear, there's three parts to the ear. So you have your external ear, you have your middle ear, there's a tympanic membrane, that's the end of the external. The middle's on the other side of it, has the smallest bones in the body, the ossicles. And the inner ear is inside your temporal bone and has all the neural structures and the receptors. So when we look at the external ear, you have your auricle or your pinna, that's your ear. And it's just a funnel, so that's why if you can't hear and you kind of go, A, eh? and you put your hand around, or you might see the old days, they had like that, I don't know, that cone-shaped thing. Um, all you do, all it's doing is, it really works, you can try it, is it just funneling the sound waves. So the sound waves come in, and then they go down through the external auditory canal. Now, you can call it the external acoustic meatus if you want, but this is what the sound waves get funneled into. We know it's lined with ceruminous earwax and hair to basically keep bugs out and then it hits the tympanic membrane which we might call our eardrum but you have to call it the tympanic membrane and so the sound waves come in and they hit that and they make it vibrate so that's the boundary between our external ear and our middle ear if we look at our middle ear it's sometimes called the tympanic cavity it is connected to your nasal pharynx your nasal pharynx is basically um, if you go in your nose okay it's part of your pharynx the nasal pharynx is connected through what well, has a couple names. You can call it the auditory tube or the eustachian tube, and it's there to help equalize pressure. So if we look at the middle ear, it's a fairly closed area except for that opening to that auditory tube. So if you fly on an air, you know, you're going on an airplane, I guess you're not flying with your arms, but you'll notice that the pressure goes up and you might like chew gum or you might yawn and you'll feel your ears pop. And what you're doing is you're letting that pressure out from your middle ear. And if not, it hurts, your ear will hurt because it actually pushes on your ear and causes a lot of pain in there and so that's the connection which on the other hand too isn't good because bacteria can travel back and forth from your nasal pharynx to your middle ear and vice versa now inside the middle ear are the three smallest bones in the human body they're called the malleus the incus and the stapes and they go right in this order so the malleus is the first one it kind of looks like a hammer the middle one, when they named these, they were blacksmiths. They thought it kind of looked like an anvil. We call it incus. And then you have the stapes. So when those sound waves come in and hit that tympanic membrane, it moves. And when it moves, the malleus moves, and then the incus moves, and the stapes. So it's just going to relay that, that sound wave. Now, the malleus is again anchored to your tympanic membrane so you can see it right there the incus is always in the middle and then the stapes attaches to an opening that's called the oval window and something called the vestibule and all they're doing is transmitting the vibrations from the eardrum from the tympanic membrane into the oval window because we're trying to move that over to our receptors now the middle ear as i mentioned you have that one opening but you can get otitis media which is a middle ear infection or an ear infection so you can get infected fluid in here it can push pressure on the eardrum and cause a lot of pain it actually looks red so when you look with that otoscope you'll see that it looks red sometimes if there's chronic infections they'll put little tubes in here which are just there to equalize that pressure if you suffer if your children get a lot of ear infections now the inner ear is sometimes called the membranous. There's a membranous and a bony labyrinth. So this is what the inner ear looks like. And this is inside the temporal bone. So the blue is there's membranes and the membranes are surrounded by bone. So you can see there's this inside and outside and there's fluid in here. Now you don't have to memorize, it's called endolymph and perilymph, but there's fluid in these structures. It's similar to cerebral spinal fluid. Now, these um, structures are gonna have fluid. So again, imagine the sound waves, right? Physical wave. So when it hits it, it's gonna make it move. That's where we're gonna be getting point. You don't have to memorize which one has endo and which one has perilymph, but we know there's fluid inside. So let's look at the structures of the inner ear. 
There's the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. Now the cochlea we're going to start with, that's our receptor for hearing. It has something called the cochlear duct. The vestibule and the semicircular canals are going to focus for balance or equilibrium. So the vestibule is in the middle. If I come back to this picture, well, it's not the best picture. Let me go to the picture of the ear for a moment. The cochlea always looks kind of like a coiled, like a snail shell. The vestibule's in the middle, and you can't miss the semicircular canals. So they each are going to have specific functions. The vestibule, static equilibrium. So like movement on one plane, like standing and sitting or walking. The semicircular canals, spinning. Okay, dynamic equilibrium is spinning equilibrium. So if we look at hearing, and by the way, this cochlea, if you want to know how big it is in a human, have you ever seen a, a little split pea? It's half the size of a split pea. That's how small the cochlea is. And inside it has six of these suckers. See, that usually five to six of these circular structures. So let me, this whole thing. There's one here. So it has these two spaces and something in the middle. Okay, so this is where we're going in. So we're looking at half of a split P and we're looking at each of these structures that I'm circling. So in this picture, there's five of them. We're gonna take one of those out and look at it. Okay, so you can see them here again half of a split P. So what we're looking at is these two air and fluid filled spaces are called scala vestibuli and scala tympani. That's what the spaces were here where I put the one and the two. You don't have to memorize their name, but there's fluid in there. What we're going to focus on is the middle piece. So again, back here, see this middle piece? It's kind of like that aqua or blue color. That's called the cochlear duct. That's what I want you to know. So the cochlear duct has the receptors for hearing. And it's between these two spaces called the scala, vest the vestibule basically, and this um, tympanic duct. But we're gonna focus right here. I told you, you don't have to memorize their names, but just know they're on either side. And remember, there's air and there's fluid there. That's important. Let's magnify this. So now we're looking at one of these and we can see my two spaces I talked about. And then this in the middle, that's my cochlear duct. So we're gonna pull that out and we're going to take a peek at the anatomy of the cochlear duct. So this is what I want you to know. Okay, so what you're going to notice, and you should have this picture um, in your notes, is there's a few pieces to this. Now this is the actual histology view. We're going to just look at this drawing. So it's called the organ of cordi. There's a basilar membrane. Think of that as the floor of the cochlear duct. Okay, so that's the bottom of it. And then the tectorial membrane, think of that as the roof, okay? And this is all the cochlear duct. So we have this gel-like roof and we have this floor. And remember, it's sandwiched between this fluid. So you might be knowing where I'm going. When this fluid moves, right, it's going to move these membranes. Look what's between them. There's little hair cells. So these are little hair cells, and you can see the hair sticking in there. So when that sound wave comes in and it moves, those hair cells are going to bend. In fact, hearing and balance is going to use mechanoreceptors. And remember that mechanoreceptors are going to respond to physical displacement. So the sound wave comes in, it's going to get funneled, eventually it gets here, and it moves this basilar membrane. And when it does that, those little hair cells hit the tectorial membrane, and boom, you get a nerve impulse. Now you need to send that nerve impulse to your brain, right? You have to send it to your auditory cortex. So the pathway, and if we just review this, as we know the sound waves come in, right? Physical movement, they hit the tympanic membrane and it vibrates. Now they're transferred one, two, three into the three ossicles. And then that sends it, remember this is the oval window. So now that sound wave goes in. You can see the number one and the number two here I drew earlier. And now this stuff is going to move. And so it, once it transfers in, it's going to actually move that basilar membrane, the floor, and that's gonna make the hair cells come in contact. Mechanoreceptors, and that's what triggers the nerve impulse. So the pathway is, once you get a nerve impulse, it leaves through the cochlear nerve. And then the cochlear nerve is going to join up with the 
vestibular cochlear nerve because that will fuse with a nerve coming from the vestibule, which we'll get to shortly. Now the vestibular cochlear nerve, you can call cranial nerve eight or auditory nerve. That goes, makes a stop over by your inferior colliculi. Remember sudden sound, turning the head. And then it's going to go to your auditory cortex, which is in your temporal lobe. So that's the pathway for hearing. Now, just a little bit about hearing. We have sound and pitch and amplitude. So again, it's just a pressure wave. The pitch is the frequency of the wave. So, you know, a wave is kind of like this, right? So this would be a higher pitch and a higher frequency because these wavelengths, they're closer together. So that would be a higher pitch. A lower pitch is slower and more spread out. The amplitude is how tall the wave is. So a very quiet wave is very, very soft, but a very loud wave is going to move more, right? So it's going to move the hair cells more. And we record this in decibels. So decibel scale is how we measure basically sound, right? How loud a sound is. And you can see typical decibel scale here you can see some common noises. Now we start to worry about hearing loss because you know these little hair cells, by the way, that we looked at, they're very fragile. You know, if you look at them, they're very, they're microscopic, they're small and they can break. And if they break, then you lose your hearing. So you can see it's a factor of how loud the noise is and the amount of exposure. So, you know, you wouldn't stand next to a rocket pad without your earmuffs on. So it's a combination of both, but very, very loud sounds, higher decibels we know cause hearing loss. Uh, I wanted to mention something called tinnitus or tinnitus, which you've probably heard of before. You hear about it as like a ringing in the ears. And so often what it is, there's a couple causes of this, but the little hairs basically keep depolarizing or they randomly move. And when they do that, they send an action potential and the brain kind of hears it as like noise. And so it's usually like a ringing or a strange noise. So it, it, it could be from that. It could be from um, circulation problems. So problems with blood flow as well. Um, sometimes it just happens with aging or it could be a sign of hearing loss. And if it gets really annoying, then you can seek treatment for it. As far as the inner ear, we're looking at the receptors for equilibrium or balance. So now we're looking at the vestibule and the semicircular canals. Now we're not getting into this too much. You don't have to memorize the names of the receptors here, but just know that the vestibule has receptors for this linear, right? We're talking about like um, simple plane changes like standing and sitting or walking. And those semicircular canals, if you look at them, it makes sense, right? But they're stimulated by any kind of rotation of the head. So if we look inside these structures, you can see the semicircular canals here, and you can see the vestibule. And it's kind of interesting because if we go all the way into the receptors, notice we have these little cilia, we have like hair cells. Um, and so you have your hair cell with these little receptors. So now when you move your head, right, there's fluid in there. And that fluid is gonna move and it's going to, to hit those receptors and that's gonna form a nerve impulse. So again, these are mechanical receptors and they're stimulated by the movement. But there's one more piece to this. So here's those hair cells I just showed you, okay? But they're embedded, there's this other layer of gel, and there's these things called otoliths. It means ear stone. So there's these little calcium crystals in there. And so when you move your head, these little crystals move. And as they move, they depolarize, and they activate, form an, a nerve impulse, for letting your brain know the direction of where your head is. So it's kind of interesting for that. And then we know though that sometimes, you know, when you stop moving, there's your, the circulation, the, the fluid in your ear and the ear stones don't always stop as soon as you stop. So sometimes they're still moving slightly and it feels like you're still moving. So the pathway for balance is the vestibular nerve is collecting all the information from the semicircular canals and the vestibule. So whether it's the dynamic spinning equilibrium from the semicircular canals or more of the static from the vestibule, that all goes through the vestibular nerve and then that fuses with the cochlear nerve to form your vestibular cochlear nerve and that's going to carry information back. Now notice it goes to your cerebellum first because your cerebellum is your center for balance, right, and coordination. It also sends information to your cerebral cortex so you're aware of your positioning of your head and your movement. 
And so motion sickness, there's pretty big things going on here, and I don't even know if they figured it all out. But basically, we know that motion sickness, one, happens from a conflict. So if you're on a boat, you're on the boat, you're looking at the horizon, and the horizon isn't moving, but you're moving because you're on a boat. That conflicting information, for whatever reason, makes you want to throw up. So we know that seasickness is pretty common. You can see some of the signs of motion sickness. If you've ever had it, it's not fun. Um, you do salivate before you throw up. I'm guessing it's more like to help with the pH of what's coming up from your stomach, the hydrochloric acid. You might break out in a cold sweat, right? Like, I'm going to throw up, I'm going to throw up. And, you know, it doesn't feel very good, but it's usually due to some sort of movement that's happening while our body's moving, but it doesn't look like it's moving. It's giving different information to our eyes. There's other things that can cause motion sickness as well, but these are some of the more like erratic head movement. When I was younger, I could go on all those roller coasters. Oh my goodness, a couple of years ago I went, and when I got off, I like couldn't walk. I could not believe how much it affected me when I'm as I've become older. And so it definitely affects you a lot more with aging. So this finishes our lecture on the ear, hearing, and balance. And it's our last A&P lecture, so I hope you enjoyed it.